Today's discussion, today's discussion is, um, it comes out of uh, observations related to your projects. Um, and as, as did our most recent uh, lecture as well. Um, uh, I saw lots of points of strength in projects. And I saw some points of, of non-strength, um, points of concern. Um, by and large, though, I'm not. I, I see lots of lots of good things in place. I, I recognize that, and I see lots of strength in the teams. Um, I'm actually quite quite happy where the teams are, but there were some technical components of this last delivery that that have been mainly troubling me. Um, some of them were at the architectural level. Some of them were at gaps in terms of underutilizing things like mocking and assertions and logging, um, uh, not using them to full potential, for example. Um, but um, there was a, an additional component too, and, and that had to do with confusions about when assertions are used and when error handling is done without assertions. I, this came up very strongly in at least one team and maybe on two teams. And uh, I want to talk with you about it. This lecture may not occupy the entire time of this slot, um, but it's a very important point. And it is a testable point. And I think it likely will be a testable point. Um, and so it's it's... It's definitely worth knowing. It's it's a very important element of modern software engineering, and it's something that I think everyone in this class should go uh, go away aware with a clear understanding of uh, uh, when assertions are used, when error handling is needed instead. Uh, and so I put together some slides here um, that drew on some some earlier slides, but but expanded. Uh, and uh, it's going to be talked about when things go better. and and handling cases where uh, things are not as you expected, um, and handling these in a mature way with the right technologies for different circumstances. Um, so, what we're going to be talking about here is uh, the handling of unexpected cases. Um, you know, commonly we as developers. We tend to think, tend to focus on the typical desired case of our of our system, or connecting to the database works, where you know the expected data is in the database, um, where the file can be opened, found on disk and opened, and it's not corrupt, uh, where where we have proper elements within um, the different uh, the different elements of that uh, file, etc. But the truth is we generally as developers have to handle many cases. And these, these problematic cases, these unexpected cases come in a certain taxonomy, a certain, there's a certain sort of uh, orderly character to them that divide them into categories. Some are end user, what I'll call end user errors. Can anyone give me an example? When I say a user error, it's a bit of a, Presumptuous statement. But what do I mean by user error? Give me, give me an example. If the user was was using a web form to uh, to enter some some information, say a, a search to perform on a on a commercial site for products, um, or maybe on one of your systems, uh, someone you know signing up for the uh, the long COVID study or something. Give me a, a sense of a user error, an end user error. Anyone? What, what what would a, a user error be? Yes, uh, Gerson. Putting the wrong yeah, putting in a wrong password might be one. Yeah. Uh, how about another one? That's good. Yes, Riley. Right. Yeah, an, an invalid character or something. Uh, so maybe you put the password even an invalid character, right? Maybe maybe it says, please only use, you know, characters from from the set, and they don't, right? Um, and they use spaces. Or maybe they're signing up for a site and they're asked to enter their, you know, their age and they banter foobar in there. 
or something like that. Right? These are what I'll call user errors. Um, the user is not behaving as we expected they would. Right? Um, how dare they? Um, you know, uh, behave in that way. Right? Um, sometimes it's a result of mistakes. Sometimes it's a result of hacking. Sometimes they're deliberately trying to make their way in, but sometimes it's um, sloppiness and sometimes it's misunderstanding, right? Another issue is resource failure. So like the network is unavailable. Why could a network be unavailable? Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. 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 Like they're in a place where, can you believe it? There's not Wi-Fi or there's not, you know, a, a, an Ethernet connection. Um, how about disk pro a disk related issue? What could go in that category? Disk is full. Disk is full. Tell me, mine's like ninety nine percent right now. <laughs> um, memory. What 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 could go wrong? What could go wrong? Memory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. For that. <laughs> They might have so many maybe like web pages or apps open that it's consuming all his RAM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it could lead to memory not be available. What's what's actually more common is because what happens when our computer uses too much memory because of like web yeah, web paths open and stuff. Um what happens to our computer when that happens? Yes or no? Well the start using um the swap yeah. memory. Uh, this, like the swap yeah. memory between the hard disk and the precise yes yeah. and and it becomes very slow. very slow and things that might take normally half a second might take five minutes and things time out right things uh you know a user task where a user is blocked a certain resource like in a database a row for a transaction it's now holding it for like five minutes when someone else needs to interact with it and it slows the whole system down. Um, you know, database connections can run out. I, I alluded to that in some like feedback to the to the teams with the problems with two-tier architectures, for example. Uh CPU cycle. Data corruption can occur. Um, you know, bad things can happen to files on disk. Uh, they can they can copy an old file into there thinking they're being, you know, that uh, because of something went wrong and they they uh, tried to fix it or what have you. Permission failure, programmer oversight is is what we're going to be dealing with. Programmer oversight or reasoning failures. And I want to talk about four main problem handling uh, approaches. And I'm not dealing here with some of the most uh, important of them um, that are that are beautiful, um, but more subtle. So specifically, there's a whole way of handling this in functional programming with monads that's close to my heart, but I'm not really going to be talking about it. But I will be talking about the ones that are most common in extant code bases, which are return codes, um, sort of uh, signaling in some sort of uh, uh, way with exceptions uh, through the use of assertions for violations of for programmer logic errors and developer mistakes, and then handling things in a more functional style with, with uh, maybe monads or, or options. And these are quite different in several regards. First of all, they're different in the caught condition. Assertions are for a certain type of use. Um, programmer mistakes or cases where a programmer's reasoning is off. The programmer is counting on A to be the case, and it's not. Uh, by contrast, exceptions are for unexpected, rare events. So it might be uh, files corrupt, or it might be um, there's a, uh, a time in the network uh, when connecting to the remote database, et cetera. These are, these are for exceptions. Um, return codes are for expected uh, events that are recently common, and you you, you return a return code to indicate you've reached the end of a link post, for example. Um, you know you're going to come to it. It's quite common. You're going to reach there, and you return it. You don't signal an exception. We'll, we'll come back to this. And, and option and maybe on it can also be used uh, for this. Um, 
These differ in terms of, of, of the level of language support. Um, and broadly, for, for the first two, most languages don't support them. Some support actually this option and maybe monad um, effectively. Um, exceptions and assertions are built in to most languages, most modern languages. There's a statement for performing an assertion that's not just a call to a function, as was the case in state of speech. Um, uh, and this question is, does it appear in debug code? All of them do. Does it appear in user shipping code? The, the code is provided to end users. And the exception here, or the one that does not is assertions down here. Okay, so we're going to go through this list, and I, I want to talk about each of these briefly in our remaining time. So first, we're going to start with return code, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um. So return code, or for a really important class of things that are unexpected, we have to deal with. I want to, sorry, they're inspected. We have to deal with them. They're not maybe our main flow of control that we're focused on, but but they come up very frequently. End of file, for example. We've reached the end of the file going through, a, a, you know, iterating through items in the file. We find the last item in a length list, a file not found error when we try to open a file, or, or item not found in a data structure. So, these uh, require some sort of handling. I mean, after all, you have to go through the entire file and we're going to get to the end of that file, right? Um, we're we're going to get to the end of a link list. So we're going to get there and you got to indicate, hey, I can't go further. I, you're at the end. Um, but the question is how to do it. And uh, traditionally, it's been with a return code. What do I mean by return? Who could say? What do we mean by this? Yes, right. 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 Yep. Good. Good call. Good call. Um. So that's exactly right. Um. So it's a special, distinguished code. It has a unique meaning. It's in, in common circumstance, like it's a distinguished value that is not the thing you would read normally. So, so you know that you've got this, this value that indicates a problem. Um, it's not just any old value, right? So maybe you look something up in a list and you want to find the index of the thing in the list and it returns minus one if it can't find it. And that's because minus one is not a legitimate thing it could normally return, right? It's not, if it were zero, it would be, you couldn't distinguish it from saying that it's in the first thing. But this minus one is value which you never return. This is lightweight, it's simple, it's time, you know, and it, these have been used uh, since uh, the oldest times of computing. Um, but there are some disadvantages of it. Um, the handling of it is not enforced. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by yes? Um, so we'll hush. Somebody can just ignore it. Someone can ignore it. They ignore in their flow of their code that the possibility that this item is not in the database table, right? Or they ignore that it's not in this array as they expect, right? Um, there's a, a risk of inconsistency. There are times where you use, I mean, this this is a classic issue in, in uh, Unix and C. Does one mean success or does one mean failure? You encountered that before? Yeah. Have to look it up every time. Yeah, I have to keep my language carefully to say my, I, I don't want to use uh, colored terms, but, but yes, um, I think, all of us have encountered a measure of frustration with this, right? Um, uh, and there's risk of misinterpretation. You know, one success, it actually means a failure, you know? Um, uh, and there's no metadata capture, right? There's no indication of what went wrong. Um, so um, there's no type safety, there's no enforced awareness. Um, 
And it turns out there's difficulty in using these with higher order functions, which are functions that return functions, for example. Um, you can't, uh, and generally, apply it to type parameterized code. Like if, if I say, this is a, a, a list of, um, of strings, um, I can, if I know it's a list of strings, uh, for example, uh, I could go and uh, return a, a string that is uh, that is somehow distinguished to indicate uh, it's not present in the list. But if it's type parameterized, uh, it could be a string, it could be a list of uh, ints, it could be a list of floats, it could be a list of hash tables. You know, being able to indicate it very clearly is, uh, is it, for many languages, it's it's a it's a problem. Uh, so it can be difficult. So return codes here um, have some best practices. So in languages like Java and C++, um, one of the best practices use enums. Does anyone know what enums are? Did you encounter that in Java? What's an enum? Okay, uh, C++. It's not in C. It's not in traditional C. Unless, unless it's in the, the latest C standard, which would be surprising. I, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, um, I don't remember it being covered in class. Help, but I've seen, I think it just maps uh, a string to a number. Yeah. So it's a it's a token. So you could say like, you know, so that's one of those. Number one, right? Uh, and Manitoba is number two, you know, uh, Alberta is number three, and you have a list of provinces, and each of them secretly is a number. And, and actually, for many of these mechanisms, you could say, what number is it, right? Um, um, for Saskatchewan or Manitoba, um, it could be um, it could be the default numbering, or it yeah. could be one you give. But then it allows you in the code to say, you know, are they in Saskatchewan? I, um, instead of just saying, are they in one, um, which is okay. So here it clearly communicates the intention of the value. It leverages the compiler for checking it. And, um, and without this, it may not be clear what one means too. So you could have a code for success, for example. You could have another code for failure, and you're not second guessing what, what is one, what is zero, I can't remember, and all that sort of silly stuff. Right. Um, uh, here, as a convention, you want to explicitly handle all possible values in the enums. You don't want to only handle one of them because it might be the other value, right? And it, it might be the failure that's that's resulting. But it's a convention, right? It's a, it's a convention. And commonly, you you define an uninitialized value if it, if it's not given at all. You if it's an uninitialized value in the variable, you make it illegal. So it means if, if no one assigned to it, it's it's an illegal. Um, so I want to ask for this last type, why not like for these cases of signaling an end of file, signaling file not found, signaling end of the link list, why not signal an exception? Why why return a value? Why why not just throw an exception to say I'm at the end of the file? Or you know the file was not found or something like that. Why why not do that? There's a reason we uh, we're careful about exception. Anyone? I actually have a question for it. Sure, uh, please. Yeah. Um, doesn't Java actually throw an exception if a file is not found? Uh, I well I it depends. It I mean, does. and I, I think it's I, supposed to handle the exception too, so it's a check exception. That is true. That is true. Yes, you're right about that. Um, so, that's not true in C++. Yeah. Yes, so, but it is true in Java. Uh, right. so yeah, because it's uh, like I, I found that weird, like that case there. And then, sure. so, like if my item is not found in the dictionary, I think Java returns the null. I want to check it doesn't find a key. Correct. Um, Although that's a that's a return value. You're right. So I'm going to question the reason yeah. you would want to return like throw an exception in file like, for that exactly the reason like file not found it just blocks the code. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's there's actually several reasons. That's one. There's actually some others, like for end of file or last item of linked list, you wouldn't want to throw an exception. 
Um, also in ship in, in ship code, uh, it might crash the program. Um, if you don't, if you don't handle it, you're saying. If it's unhandled. Yeah. If it's unhandled, that's right. Okay, so that's good. Like, uh, and of course, you can forget to handle it, right? You make some, some exceptions yeah. aren't required, like. For example, yeah, right. There's right. checked and unchecked exceptions, yeah. and as we'll see, it, that's the distinction that's made. But it doesn't always mean it's handled well. Mm -hmm. But um, it does make sure there's some handling of it. But there's another reason too that's very significant with exceptions that you you don't want to signal with exceptions here, particularly for these these posts too. Yes, if exceptions not handled well, you will. Uh, be one. uh okay so so that's linked to what uh well Haj was saying about what's the impact of an unhandled exception and there are systems where it will warn you but it will also you know lead to it and fall out right like uh there are there are systems where well thank you this is a stack job because it was unhandled but there's an issue with with exceptions and performance and loose ends to be performed. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to this. Okay, um, loose ends that have to be fixed up. And I'll let you think about what some of those, um, those, those uh, loose ends are. Um, okay, let's, let's talk though about some exceptional conditions. Um, these first ones are common expected conditions. Um, Dictionary keys not found, end of file, last item and link list. But uncommon ones include things like memory exhausted, disk full, network unavailable, right? A timeout is connecting, broken connection, corrupt file. These are these are things that are that can occur. We have to be able to handle them in our code. It's not a mature thing. It's not a Acceptable thing to just say, well, what the heck? I'm not going to handle, you know, if, if the file isn't there or if the disk is full. You want it in robust software, you want to be able to handle these things, particularly memory exhausted or network unavailable. But these are these are rare circumstances pushed upon us, right? They're not occurring just commonly in day-to-day -day operations like this first class is commonly. And as a basic part of working with these systems. Here, we're dealing with these truly uh, exceptional um, conditions. Uh, um, they're, they're not rare necessarily, or true, they're not profoundly rare. Things may go wrong, um, and we have to be able to handle it. We want a way to signal if something has gone wrong. We stop processing of the code, and we go back to some context where we know how to handle it, right? The idea is we sort of roll up the call stack. We, you know, maybe we, uh, A is called B, B is called C, C is called D. And somewhere along that line, there might be something that knows what to do if, you know, the file is not found or we timed out or something like that. It will connect to a backup database or it would use a local database or it would put a error message to the user or what have you. So here, Java and many other languages these days use these exceptions. And, and in many of these languages, they're, they're thrown when they occur and they're caught in cameras. Um, I think you should all be familiar with this, right? Um, and different languages like C Sharp has its own uh, way of, of handling them that's uh, a little bit, little bit uh, refined from some of the support in Java, et cetera. But, um, Java is also borrowed over the years from that. And so, so there's often a trolley. What goes in the trolley? Can anyone say? What goes in trolley? What goes up here? Yes. Uh, so, uh, statements that will throw the, potentially throw the exception. Exactly. Um, so, so, as Marmix said, this try block has code that is going to try doing something, right? And if it encounters problems, by problems, I mean an exception is, is thrown. Then one of these catches, we hope will we'll catch it, right? We, we try to catch all the, the possibilities, right? Um, and then there's down here, a finally clause that kind of handles cleanup. Um, 
from from these. Uh, so if, if after the the exception handlers are performed, or the try block is performed and, and an exception is not handled, we we uh, we can do finally to sort of clean clean up some things. Um, what sort of things might go in a in this cleanup block that that might be that that might need uh, handling uh, cleaned out uh, be cleaned up from this try problem? Yes, uh, uh, clone any uh, files. closing files, closing database connections, other other resources opened up here, right? Um, uh, so so here you know we have we have in these blocks. Uh, you know, exception types, and we have to handle the exception types. Sometimes we throw another exception to a higher level that's more generic, for example, that's more general, or that adds additional information. But hopefully one of these error blocks, one of these catch blocks will resolve the problem, right? Hopefully it will do something intelligent to remedy the problem. Notify the user and set expectations at the least, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, what are some major drawbacks of exceptions? Anyone say? What, what are some drawbacks? Most students are often not fully aware of this. But, you know, there's, there's an important part in your computer science career um, where you go from Reasoning, I can do that, and, and that being the success and being able to build that, and being able to ask, can I do it with sufficient performance and scalability for it to be acceptable? And sometimes students only go through that after graduating, but in industry, there's keen awareness about whether solutions not just are possible, but whether they are sufficiently scalable, um, extensible. Uh, uh, able to be uh, worked on by a team. There's it's a lot more than building. It's about building a system that is sufficiently performant to be realistic, for example. And there is an issue with exceptions that you have to be really careful about. Anyone know what it is? What's the trade-off with exceptions? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, it does occur at runtime. And what's the implication of that? Right. Yes, it really impacts efficiency. And so it turns out maintaining exceptions and especially triggering exceptions is really expensive. So when you have a try block and you enter the try block, the fact that it has these catches around it, it actually has to set up a fair bit of data structure to enter this, because it has to be ready, right? If something goes wrong, it has to be able to know where to go at these levels. Remember, try block might fall successive functions in here, methods in here, one after the other after the other. And if any of them throw an except one of these exceptions, it'll propagate all the way up until there's a catch. So if anything inside here, I'm not just talking about code, physically lexically placed in here, like placed in this block, but things called by this block and things called by that and things called by that. If any of that goes wrong and there's no there's no handlers in that code, it will pop up to this level. So it has to maintain these data structures about like where do I go if things go wrong inside of this? Does that make sense? Okay, so that costs something, but what's especially expensive is when the exception is triggered. Why is that expensive? Why is it expensive when an exception is triggered? What has to happen? Any sense? So, transfer of control. Yeah, transfer of control. And where does where does control get transferred to? To where does control get transferred? Well, I alluded to it earlier, right? It it has to propagate upwards. Um, all sorts of neat things in here, but seemingly no markers. Um, Oh man. Um, uh, so so uh, it sort of wipes galore. Um, oh man. Uh, but, uh, but 
Sorry? Oh my God, that would be awesome. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, wow, this is awesome. And make sure I give the best. That's from me. Chance favors the prepare. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's actually important. Metaphysical statement. Chance favors the prepare. Um, Light favors people that are prepared, that come prepared. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so Gene, you're 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 setting yourself up for a good one. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's better than the space ones. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let's let's try the the red. Right. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Like the dream of centuries. Um okay, awesome, awesome. This is this is amazing. Um what's that? This is uh so I'll tell you a secret. Uh I'm I'm one of the I'm I'm like a uh, secret Santa Claus that periodically puts markers over things. Um so yes, so once a year I try to refresh the trick. Um, and I do so because I run events, and then I buy more first events because can't rely on those, right? And then after that I said like let's leave them in the space. Yeah, keep them there. And, and but then they run down by this time of year. And so the cut summer is coming and I'll have another set. So I'm a I'm the secret Santa. Um Mumble. I, 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 I don't, I don't know. <laughs> if, if you find out, let me know. Um, they're better about the place. What's that? No, no. Um, I actually think it's a, it's a gap. Um, I don't, I don't think that there's any authority for that. I will take it up with the undergrad chair. We'll, we'll see if we can get someone <laughs> get someone assigned to that desk. And that person may be in the room. In fact, I'm in front of the room right now. Um, but it's, it's, it's a big We'll see. But I'm the person already who seems to be the secret Santa. So uh, maybe that's just as well. Anyway, okay, moving right along. Um, so if you have a tri block up here, um uh and you have some code and maybe you know you call foo and this is maybe foo and it calls bar and bar calls off to baz down here um uh these are sweet markers geez uh, you know uh if baz signals the exception and there's no handler along the way this is has catch state you know catch statements here um it will need to roll up here, and it will need to roll up here, and it will need to roll up here. So Alex is exactly right. You have you have a transfer control going up, but it has to roll up. And what has to happen at each of these roll points? Well, it has to get rid of all the variables that were created there. That may mean closing certain things up uh, in terms of uh, you know, no longer having references to certain data structures, et cetera. Um, and things may be missed here, right? Like you might open a file down here um, that isn't handled properly. And and now suddenly you bomb up and you bomb up, up out of that and this isn't closed, right? Um, that is possible. This is the danger. Uh, but it has to somehow undo things at each step. And that means, you know, bring up memory, et cetera, that was allocated here and, and going up and up. So there's a lot of work that goes on and, and there's data structures that have to maintain where to go to if I see an exception of this type or that type. So exceptions have high performance costs. I, I was uh, talking with someone whose company was trying to ship a product and they discovered that it was untenably slow in certain cases. So this is a non-functional requirement that failed. And they looked into it, and it turns out the big problem was exceptions were being thrown frequently. 
and it was slowing it down by literally a factor of 10, the product. So they, they re-engineered that and it sped it up literally by a factor of 10, you know, because it was that much of a bottleneck. Um, memory leaks can happen in some languages where you don't free up memory when you're backing up. Um, research cl resource closure issues. Again, you open a database connection here, who's going to close it? It doesn't know to close it automatically when it rolls things back because of an exception that not only handles up above. Uh, it's hard to recognize mistakes in code um, because it's handled like far away from where the problem occurs. And so there's there's you know also the possibility the code may just stop at, at some point in it and bomb out of there and the rest of the code won't be executed that you're you you played out. Uh, it can break in some cases abstraction, sort of subtyping rules, and in some cases where subtypes are are involved in the uh, declaring of, of exceptions. Um, now, languages in, in the past 10 years have really invested in you know, a couple of features like garbage collection and finally and forced declaration of exceptions, forced handling of, 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 of exceptions. Okay. Um, so there's a high performance cause, difficulty in reasoning, lack of type safety in some cases, difficulty of composing uh, into higher level suggestion, uh, higher level, uh, higher level code. Um, so here for exceptions, generally you want to translate exceptions. Um, uh, if you're passing through language layers, we talked for there being, for example, multiple layers in a three tier system. And generally, if you have these multiple layers, you want to pass up exceptions in a language for that layer. You want to handle generally as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, don't throw exceptions for things that can't be reasonably handled. Uh, you can reuse common exceptions rather than creating your own. In Java, you could create an exception by subclassing it, but generally you want to be cautious about that. And try to document the cause for exceptions. Like try to include a message that says what, uh, what happened here and, and include that relevant um, contact or, or information in, in the message or context in the message. And where possible, aim for um, atomic operations, things that happen all together. Well, what I really wanted to talk about, especially, was assertions. The goal of assertions is to fail early and fail often. I'm going to give you back to before I forget. These are the things that we're saying super much. Awesome. Okay, so the goal here is to alert the programmer to misplaced assumptions as soon as possible. So if a programmer reasoning is off base, you want to alert them soon. And the goal is to bring the occurrence of an obvious failure as close to the underlying fault as, as possible. So you want to be checking assumptions along the way that you know when you look this up in the database that it's not null or there's no duplicates in this list or you know, there's no uh, no key in the database or what have you. Assertions uh, play several roles. One is it documents assumption. What do I mean by documenting assumption? If I say assert, you know, that i is greater than zero and i is an index that I'm using in a certain way, what is how is that helpful to document my assumption? Yes. Yeah. Other yeah. So it it characterizes my, my that I am approaching this with knowledge or confidence that that I cannot be zero here, um, or that I equals j. And this code assumes that I can put in a comment, but this is operationally checking it in an assertion. It actually checks that if it's not the case, it will let me know. Right. So it's better than a comment because a comment will go unchecked. But it also documents the likelihood of time. It reduces the likelihood that an error will, will slip through. It helps discourage kind of latency handling of common cases and, and forces the developer to deal with, with, with bugs before continuing writing more code. If there's a problem, it will often find it early and closer to where the problem is and therefore reduce 
the bugging spot. It finds it closer to where the problem is rather than maybe many minutes later or maybe hours later. Maybe the original problem was someplace and then has some data that's bad. It sticks it in the database and it's only the next few days that someone queries that data and finds that it's, it's meaningless. Where did that error come in? It came in days ago. But if that code, before it inserted it, had done a check, does this data make sense? It would it would allow you to, to find where the problem was much quicker. You, 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 you know where to look for its source. And it helps improve the thoroughness of, of tests. So, so it moves from false to, uh, basically it, it helps failure be found closer to false and, and show false in terms of faulty reasoning leads to an observation that causes a failure. So it brings failures closer to the underlying problem by, by performing an assertion. So the goal here is offensive program. It's, it's trying to get a broken program to fail early, but it's broken in a certain way. It's not, you, you cannot use assertions to indicate the user has done something unexpected. That's a bad use of, a, of an assertion. It, it basically is saying, you know, I'm bombing out of this program because you didn't answer the right thing. That's not, that's not acceptable. It's also not acceptable to do this for memory exhaustion. Why is that not an acceptable use of assertion for it to fail if memory is exhausted? A mature programmer has to be able to handle it. It's not, it's basically assertions capture, have to respond to where our reasoning is off, where our assumptions are off as developers. Memory being exhausted is inconvenient, but it's not an assumption where my reasoning is off base. It's a it's an inconvenient fact that's foisted upon me. And you should not use assertions to deal with situations where inconvenient things that can happen are foisted upon. You actually use them to highlight when we have things that are that are uh, misplaced assumptions. Yeah. Um, so common things that are that are handled here are things like logical oversight by the property by, by the programmer. So a property of a data structure is not maintained. This thing contains duplicates and it shouldn't, for example. Um, or uh, that an algorithm should guarantee some basic property. So if I search, for example, for flights from South to Boston, they have to go in contiguous airports, right? And it can't go to like Saskatoon to Denver and then New York City to Boston. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. It needs to be contiguous top from one A to B, B to C, C to D, right? Um, that's like, that's a property that it should handle. And often with algorithms, we want internal, um, and, you know, an internal consistency. Also contracts in code, right? Three conditions, post conditions, invariance and history properties we may come to in a separate lecture. But these are things that are code counts on, you know, with three conditions. And post conditions, we're supposed to guarantee them. What we guarantee is that the post conditions are should hold when our code is done if the preconditions held to start it. So if the preconditions hold and the post conditions don't hold, our code, our implementation of the code has a problem. And assertions can be used to check that. I want to highlight that assertions can go on at, at many levels. They can check two variables are equal, i equals j, or that i is greater than zero, or whatever, that this thing returned true, or this thing is not null. That's good. But another thing is you can check, for example, does a brute force algorithm give the same answer as a really clever, efficient one? Some years ago in this class, does anyone here use click and go app uh, for the bus business now? Okay, uh, so can you try to find bus schedules these days? Uh, do you set your train set out? Okay, so before that, there was 
uh, approaching go. And before that, there was no system like that. So students in this class for one of the projects built one. And it was great. And they got all excited. They're interested in seeing if the city would be interested. And some really sharp students were involved in the programming contest and so on. You know, wanted to put in place really clever algorithm for finding the best route from A to B. And, you know, in terms of, of, of distance or in terms of time or what have you. And they had a really efficient algorithm for doing this. But when I tested it, I found there were some problems. You know, I'd say like, take the bus from Glassboro to 23rd Street, and then get off the bus at 23rd Street and get back on the bus. <laughs> get off the bus again at 23rd Street and get back on. And get off one more time and then take bus 11 to the airport. Um, so it, it had some problems. The irony was they could have implemented brute force out there really, really easily. Right now, they would never want to use them, it might be too expensive. But in an assertion, they could check is the result of the efficient algorithm giving the same result as the result of the brute force. At least check that it's correct, right? Um, and that's a perfectly good assertion. And you say, well, it's crazy, you're running both algorithms. Yes, but assertions are generally removed in hard time. So it would only be tested in the test phase. And running code, the assertion would disappear. So it's not actually running the brute force algorithm. It would only be running the efficient algorithm. But every time you run a test case, it's checking, are those two equal? Brute force algorithm, easy to, to implement. The, the efficient algorithm, hard to implement correctly, but much more efficient. You know, required uh, environment variables to not define some of your code had that keep is not corrupt or reference test is non zero or results of, of new refactored code and old code is, is equal, right? Your refactor code, you want to make sure it gives the same results as old code. Um, you want to make sure that an algorithm returns a value that's at least correct. So maybe you have a square root algorithm, a complex algorithm, but Whatever answer you get back, if you call square root of D, where D is a double, whatever you get back, what, what should be the case? If you call square root of D, whatever number you get back, because after this very complex algorithm, what, what property should it guarantee? If you get back X from square root, what, what should you be able to check? Okay, it should be could be positive as long as it's defined that way. It could be defined to give positive and negative, but okay, let's let's say it, it's defined to give the positive side. Okay. Yeah. X squared equals D. Right? That's something you could check easily. It's a property of it. It's very simple to check. And it demonstrates correctness. And generally we don't have that ability to check. Is it completely not correct answer? But we can check properties of it. Is it positive, right? Um, is it greater than a certain value? Is it within a certain range? So, well, how about the uh, results of being refactored for multiple? Yes. Yeah. How, how would you go about doing that? And, if you kept around the old code, and so maybe you have an old version of the algorithm and a new version that's cleaned up a lot, et cetera, um, you want to check. Just like with the brute force and the efficient, you know, do they give the same results for now? And then you can deprecate that old code, get rid of that. Oh, 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 What's that? Oh, that? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yes. Um, um, well, I'll be. Um, well, ain't that something? Um, uh, okay. Uh, I guess it's telling me a message. Um, okay, uh, so let me just see if there's any. So so you could leave that code in place, confirm they're the same for now, and then you'd work to get rid of it after testing is completed, right? The deal is that a lot of the time here, and, and I don't know why this is, uh, I guess, mumble. Um, uh, okay, um, this is, this is not not a happy thing. Um, I guess you could see it there, right? Um, 
So assertion is for, for many projects, it was only occurring in the bottom. Uh, in other words, the roof was shifting. Um, for a bus code, you, you often want to put it logic as ever the handling for assertion. So here's what I say assertion. Are not error. Okay. They're not error. You need for things not under your control that aren't misplaced programmer functions, that aren't problems with programmer reasoning, you use error handling to handle them. That's the mature way to handle it. Memory error, this, you know, a file not found on this, 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 this file is corrupt. Uh, you have this full. You know, time out connection to the network. You cannot use an assertion for those. It's not the result of a programmer misplaced assumption. It's not the result of faulty reason. It's an inconvenient fact of the world that you have to handle. You put in place an error handler, not an assertion phase. Does that make sense to people? That's the key principle I'm trying to communicate here. Um, so for most robust code, even programmers, you know, misplaced programmer reasoning, you might want to handle that as error, like a precondition that fails, right? Let's suppose someone calls my code and they do not observe the precondition. I could just say assert false and say I'm falling out of here, you know, it's your problem. But what's more mature? So that's fine. And I will welcome if you want to do that. Technically, I'm not responsible. If, if you don't call me with passion and business, I'm not responsible for it, technically. But in the most robust code, you might want to handle it with an error handler, just so the user doesn't get an assertion failure. Um, tie in the logging, log assertion, assertion checks you know, in some cases. Um, Make a particularly big one involving like algorithm results or the database was connected to properly or what have you. Um, make a habit of, of checking pre conditions, post conditions, and do not use them to handle unusual situations, things that can happen without a failure of programming re programmer reason. Okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, um, I think um, I think I'll. I'll stop uh, stop here. We're out of time. I want to thank you for your uh, patience today and for you know making uh, making it here for the uh, the lecture.